We all know that Edward Sunshine is an accomplished businessman who leads Toronto's largest REIT. Tonight I want to focus on the fact that this is a man who is so committed to our community that in addition to many things encompassing sitting on some of Toronto's most critical boards in philanthropy, he has chosen to live a zealous life outside of the corporate world. He was awarded the Queen's Council and was invested into the Order of Ontario. We are very fortunate to have him with us here today and not find out what he does, but why he does it. So please everybody welcome a warm, caring individual who's our first speaker of the night, who will share a side of him that is not often discussed in papers, but is arguably or certainly more important to his life and values, Edward Sunshine. He's taller than me, I think. <laughs> Just guessing. Um, you know, why I really do what I've done the last 40 years, 45 years, is really to make a living. But, you know, at a certain point, you get past that. Um, I actually started reacan because I couldn't, didn't have anything else to do. But uh, I sort of bummed out as a lawyer. And I really got tired of that. And I said, okay, I got to do something else. And I think I can do real estate better than all my clients could. And I won't tell you who they were, but... <laughs> so anyway, usually I speak about retail trends, I've spoken about real estate uh, development, about real estate finance, about capital markets. Uh, some strange group even once had me speak about uh, board governance, which really isn't my area of expertise, but I did it anyway. But uh, when Rabbi Lipner and I spoke, he asked me to speak about Jewish identity, uh, Jewish values, and how they've interrelated, intersected with my business life. I suspect that if I had known beforehand that this is what I was gonna speak about, I'd probably be just hunkering down to watch Game of Thrones right now, <laughs> rather than standing here in front of you. Oh, good. That's not such a prize seeing my face, but okay. <laughs> but I did accept, expect, accept, so this afternoon I had to start thinking about what I was gonna to say tonight, and I actually made some notes, much to uh, Ellis's displeasure. <laughs> Funny thing was, when I did start to think about, um, you know, what would I say tonight? And, you know, what does being my identity as a Jew and Jewish values, uh, what do they mean to me? And when I really started thinking about it, I said, you know, they've actually had a major impact on my business life. To explain this statement, I think some history is in order. Because, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's an old maxim, and I'm a great believer in it, that you don't know where you are or even where you're going unless you know where you came from. And where I came from was parents who were Holocaust survivors. I was born in a very charming displaced persons camp called Bergen-Belsen, 1947. And uh, my biggest break was that my parents came to Canada in 1949. Um, in case you want to know why a lot of people came in 49, read a book called None is Too Many by Professor Irving Abella. Uh, prior to 49, it was almost impossible for Jews to get into Canada. Anyway, while a very tiny percentage of survivors and their children hid or disavowed their Jewish identity, figuring, you know, it had never really brought them anything but tragedy in the past. So even though I, I certainly don't uh, favor it, it's, it's somewhat understandable. But the vast majority of survivors, and certainly the vast majority of their children, have absolutely no doubt who they are. In my case, I was very proud of my parents, their ability to make a new life in a country where they were essentially functionally illiterate, as they couldn't speak the language or read English, and they knew almost no one, a couple of cousins. Everybody has a couple of cousins. In fact, my wife of almost 45 years has often told me that I wear my, uh, my background on my sleeve. Like always, she's right, I do. And I should also add, with respect to sort of more local history here in Toronto, that Toronto was a very different place in the 50s and the 60s than the wonderful multi multicultural city we live in today. Jewish professionals, accounting, uh, law, medical uh, doctors, uh, they couldn't get jobs 
in the uh, in the hospitals, in the uh, in the law firms of the time, which is why you saw so many Jewish law firms started in the 50s, the 40s, even even prior to that. In fact, why Mount Sinai Hospital was started. Now, obviously, that's changed a lot. But even when I graduated from law school, which I hate to say, it's probably undoubtedly before most of you were born, uh, 1970, I didn't even go for interviews at the big dominant firms of that time, uh, which are probably still the same ones, like McCarthy's, Tories, uh, Oster's, because they, they really just didn't hire Jewish guys. They figured it out two, three years later that they're missing the best and brightest, but <laughs> at that time they hadn't quite figured it out yet. So like everybody else, I joined uh, a Jewish firm. But as a result of my path, my history tended to make me very paranoid, actually, about non-Jews. And I don't know if it was simply the clannishness that we Jews are sometimes criticized for, or whether it was that paranoia, but all my good friends are Jewish. I play golf at Oakdale, which some of you may know is virtually all Jewish. I think I just skipped the page, but that's okay. <laughs> Actually, it's not okay, hang on. All right. <laughs> and there are mezuzahs on the doors, at Riyakan, subtle, but they're there. And uh, what I'd call the executive committee at Riyakan, the top nine executives, including myself, who actually run the company, we meet every week and make pretty well all the decisions, seven out of nine of them are Jewish. Now I'd hasten to say it's not a result of a plan, as I really do try to hire the best for anything, but you know, somehow it's worked out that way, and it's probably because of my own comfort zone. But I've managed somehow to get invited to be on the board of the Royal Bank of Canada, where I continue, as my wife says, to wear who I am on my sleeve. I don't think they quite call me the Jewish board of director, uh, director but maybe they do. I don't know. Uh, but I have gotten about a half a dozen of them to go to Israel over the last few years, so it's been very worthwhile. I joined the Toronto Club. And I don't know if any of you have ever been to the Toronto Club, but uh, if I can say this, if it's in not impolite, it is the most goyish place I've ever been to. <laughs> they, they have pictures on the walls of people who, who would not even ever have said hello to me if they had lived even until now. <laughs> and that one I joined actually just to see if I could, much to my surprise, I could. <laughs> so, clearly knowing who you are, or even wearing it on your sleeve like I do, doesn't really hold you back in Toronto in the 21st century. Quite frankly, I think being Jewish is great. And although, and it's, it's not just, we all enjoy the wonderful holidays and the family times that seem to go with it, but what really fills me with joy sometimes is the feeling of belonging to a great people, a great something. We number about 14 million worldwide less than two-tenths of one percent of the world's population. It's a pretty small club. But we sure punch above our weight in virtually every human field of endeavor. Maybe not sports. <laughs> Certainly not hockey. I'll just say a few words in closing about how Jewish values are actually integrated, I believe, in, in my business life as well. Philanthropy, both personally and corporately, is something that runs through everything we do and every one at Riyakan. Both I and Fred Wax, Riyakan's Chief Operating Officer, are past chairs of the UJA annual campaign, and almost everybody in the senior ranks at Riyakan does something. They're involved in the community, not necessarily always Jewish charities. We're, we're involved in, in other things as well because I think it's important to show the non-Jewish world that we don't just care about ourselves, that we do care about the other sides of the community as well. But I think the, the Jewish value that really has driven me throughout my career, and, and quite frankly, I think has played a large part in whatever success I've managed to enjoy, and that's that, that word integrity. Um, to me, it's simply doing what I say I'm gonna do, almost no matter what the difficulties and almost no matter uh, how the situation has changed, because the situation always changes. Whenever you promise to do something, somehow it tends to be a lot harder, usually, than when you made that promise. But Riyakan, and it's something I, I really think 
ha has become part of our, our basic culture. If we say we're going to deliver something, it may take us a little longer. It's perfect here for Lawrence Schwartz, who I understand is in the logistic business. I bet you he eventually always delivers too. <laughs> Actually, you, do, you uh, deliver perishables, so you've got to deliver really quickly. We don't have to do it that quickly. Um, you know, even the guy who's going to follow me up here, Ellis Jacob, who we do a lot of business with. Uh, I don't know if, if Rhea Ken is Ellis's largest landlord at Cineplex, but we've got to be close. And, uh, you know, if Ellis and I do a handshake, that's the deal. And neither one of us are going to resile from that deal. No matter how tough things get, Ellis might whine a little <laughs> about, <laughs> about how much money the new theater's costing him. But, you know, the basic deal is the basic deal. And I like to think we deal with all our tenants that way, not just people we're friendly with. Uh, and, um, you know, that goes a long way when you're dealing with bankers in the, court, in the capital markets, when you're dealing with tenants, you're dealing with shareholders. If you acquire that reputation, and you, the only way to acquire it is by doing it every day, of doing what you say you're going to do, or die trying. Well, the financial version of dying anyway. Um, you will obtain that, that reputation of integrity, and it will take you a long way, I believe. So I lost myself totally in my notes here, and uh, I think I am about to finish up. You know, that's the problem with notes. I can't find the end of it. Okay, so I think I'm going to end. <laughs> and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Let's have, let's have a couple questions from anybody in the, uh, in the audience, anything that you... Uh that you would like to ask. Yeah, don't feel you have to ask. I, I told Noah that at my uh, shareholders' meetings, I never get any questions. <laughs> They're usually frightened. So just a show of hands if someone wants to ask a question. Yeah, Mr. Jason Feinstein. I'm just curious. On the, on the subject of integrity, um, small business or large business, when you're managing other people, um, from an employee standpoint or from the manager's standpoint, when you run into conflicts with, um, with mistreatment, ill treatment of other, people's or other people around you, um, from, from both perspectives, because I'd be curious from both perspectives, how is that something that you might deal with? So you mean like sort of are people, people mistreating somebody or are people being mistreated? No, it has nothing to do, not a, not a religion, uh, not religious based at all, no, no. really just more so. In uh, a business sense. In a business sense and treating employees and, uh, and people around you with, with integrity, respect, consideration. Well, um, you know, I'll, I'll try to, I'm not sure I, know it's hard. I it's totally understand, question. but I'll try to put a couple of sort of faces on it if I may. Um, if one of our employees is acting to somebody, I mean, we've got, I don't know, about 630 employees across Canada, uh, now another 30 or so in the States. So obviously I can't, uh, I can't know what any one of them are doing at any given time. But you'd be amazed when you have a corporate reputation for acting with integrity and one of your employees doesn't, it bubbles up to the top sooner or later. And I put a stop to it. Um, you know, uh, typically it's not like I run and fire somebody if I find they're, they're acting uh, inappropriately, uh, but they'll be warned and hopefully their behavior will change. We have somehow, God help me, I've got a nine person HR department that, you know, I, I give uh, very careful instructions. Never wanted to run a company that had an HR department, now there's nine people. It's something, <laughs> something I have trouble dealing with. And as far as, uh, you know, dealing inappropriately from the outside. Uh, I mean, we have a very standard uh, saying at Can. You know, somebody can screw us once, but they won't screw us twice. And uh, if they do, you know, the old story, shame on us. Um, we've been misled, we've been lied to up and down the chain of command over the years. And, you know, I'm not a big guy for suing. I don't like suing. Doesn't mean I won't, but I've done it occasionally, but I, maybe I practiced law for too long. I know how, how futile the whole process can be. I'm sorry. I apologize in advance to all the lit litigators here. But um, uh, we just won't deal with those people again. And again, fortunately for us, we're big enough that that means something in the business world. It didn't 15 years ago, but now 
you know, we're, we're everybody's largest landlord. We're the largest owner of shopping centers in Canada. People don't want to mess with us. So it, it tends to keep people on a straight and narrow. That's why they don't ask questions by me. I give very long answers. I'm sorry. <laughs> we have one more question back here. Sure. Thank you. Um, so obviously you have a big inspiration of corporate um, social responsibility at Rio Can, and, and you have, I guess, the power and influence to encourage your employees um, to participate. Ho in hopefully by example, hopefully rather than order. Exactly. Um, do you, is, is that something that you carry through to your, your clients as well, or do you sometimes turn down a client because they don't um, display or, or anything, like, uh, because they don't have the same sort of ethics that, that your company That's a, that's a good question, I, and, I, and I have to say the answer to that simply is, is no. Uh, I've got large responsibilities at Recan, it's a public company, uh, and at the end of the day, we're there to do business, hopefully in a, in a proper way, but if I happen to know some tenant doesn't give to charity or he doesn't treat his wife nice, you know, at the end of the day, that's not my moral decision to make. That means I'm not gonna rent them space. We have to do, and that's, so no, I won't hold that against somebody. We Unless I have a choice. We have one more if there's time. Do one more. All right, thanks very much. Uh, question, Rio Can obviously being a public company, you're responsible to your shareholders. Correct. How then do you uh, get through every annual, maybe it's a, a budget or a certain percentage that Rio Can is allowed to give to charity and do your shareholders have a say in what charities they want uh, Rio Can to invest in? Uh, to answer the last question first, no. They don't get a say in that. Um, and uh, the way we do it, it's a little bit sneaky, but um, uh, there is a line item in our annual budget gets approved by the board uh, that basically is just charitable donations. Um, typically, we run it at one half of 1% of our free cash flow. Uh, this year, that budget line would be two and a half million dollars. And to make it socially acceptable to our, to our uh, unit holders, uh, probably most of whom aren't Jewish, and at least half of whom are institutions that don't even reside in Canada. We basically said we would dedicate, uh, our sort of mission statement that we came up with a long time ago is that we would dedicate the largest part of our philanthropies to healthcare institutions in the cities in which we do business. Um, and nobody can really argue with that. And in fact, the uh, emergency room in Kingston General Hospital is the Recan emergency room. And we have a, a couple of rooms in Oakville and one in Orangeville and one in Calgary. And by coincidence, the largest corporate donations we make each year are to places like Baycrest and Mount Sinai Hospital, which, you know, happen to be healthcare institutions. But basically it's healthcare and then there's, you know, a few hundred thousand that sort of falls off the table and I deal with. Thank you very much. I'm done. Good. Thank That's you. it. That's a wrap. We appreciate it. Thank you. Watch your stuff here. Okay.